Colin McCann is with us. If I tried to list all of Colin McCann's literary awards, I mean, he's pretty much won all the big ones except the Nobel. I think that's uh, that's to come. But if I try to do all that, we'll that I'll use up all the time for the interview. Uh, you know him best probably from Let the Great World Spin, but uh, author of many other works of fiction, most recently 13 Ways of Looking. We're going to talk about this book. We're also going to talk about something that happened here in Connecticut. In fact, it happened outside the study in New Haven, where we often do live broadcasts of this show. In fact, we did a live broadcast from there, I think, two weeks after the incident that involved Mr. McCann. But before we even get to that story, I want to, A, welcome you to the show, Colin McCann. Thank you so much. And I want to say that I'm sitting right now in a basically enclosed studio. But if I walked out the door and took five steps toward a window, I could look at the route that Wallace Stevens walked every day from his home in the West End of Hartford to his job at an insurance company in Hartford. He was famous for walking it, not driving it. And now that walk is commemorated by these little stone markers every few blocks, each one with a verse from 13 Ways of Looking and a blackbird. So I want to begin by just talking about that. The, the novella that, that begins this book, it's this very Joycean uh, story of this judge uh, towards the end of his life, and now it turns out his life is going to end even faster. But it's framed by 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. So since I'm sitting in Hartford, tell me about Wallace Stevens. Tell me about what that poem meant to you and why you chose it as a title for your book and, and a framing device for that story. I think my favorite verse is possibly everybody's favorite verse. It's the fifth stanza of that poem. I do not know which to prefer, the beauty of inflections or the beauty of innuendos, the blackbird whistling or just after. And I've always was taken by that notion. It's like it's such a gorgeous verse about time, about shifting, about beauty itself. And I remember... um, hearing about an incident that uh, happened in a White Castle restaurant many, many years ago. A murder occurred in a White Castle restaurant, and it had been taped on 13 different cameras. And I thought that was an extraordinary story. And I took the basis of that story. I remembered 13 ways of looking at a blackbird, and I thought, okay, maybe I can take that story and supplant it and um, turn it into another story in New York, which is what I tried to do. So I set up a, a situation where there's a character, a judge in New York, who gets randomly punched in the chest or seemingly randomly punched in the chest and is seen from all these different angles, all these different ways of looking. Possibly overestimating the poetic qualities of detectives who investigate these uh, murders, but in a very wonderful way. Uh, this notion, really, that you know, that while while they're watching all of this raw footage, that they're really they're looking for the tiniest nuance in a very quotidian scene that may or may not be connected to the murder at all. This notion of the cameras, it kind of it surfaces again at the end of the book. We'll be talking a bit more about that story as we go along, but the very last thing you see. In in the book is this woman who's had a confrontation with a man who had brutalized her and raped her 37 years ago. And it's happening in this little convenience store in London. And she realizes that this whole exchange, which has included her unbuttoning her blouse to remind him of the terrible wound, has been caught on this on the security cameras again. So clearly these are on your mind somehow, Colin McCann. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm ambivalent about the security cameras. Part of me thinks that they're wonderful to have because we can solve so many things. Um, We can be watching and and be vigilant in certain ways. And then part of me just thinks it's horrendous to be under surveillance, more or less, every little moment of of your day. I live in New York City, and I know that my movements could be mapped around the city. And even in many places inside, in various rooms and restaurants, you could make a mathematical diagram of how I chose to walk around, say, today. So I'm, I'm, I'm ambivalent as to whether they're good or not. But a wonderful device in order to help a writer get into a scene. They become sort of painterly if you can investigate what happens and how it unfolds on, on a camera. 
I think they also raise real questions about what knowing is. It's it's odd. We're taping this interview. I just got off the air uh, from a one-hour live show talking about baseball, and we were talking about video replays in baseball and kind of the illusion that if you can see that thing, you can know that thing. Uh, you know, if you can watch it again, uh, you can know that thing. And, you know, in baseball, what they've discovered is that sometimes a runner slides into the base and it appears to have stolen the base. And to the naked eye, he's stolen the base. But if you look really carefully for a microsecond, he bounced a little bit off the bag while the tag was still on him. So w- which thing is the reality, the thing that could never be humanly perceived but is preserved on tape or what our actual experience of, of reality is? And in a way, that the initial story in this collection reminds me a little bit of Don DeLillo's Libra, where at a certain point, this CIA agent, agent or whatever he is, he's got a tremendous amount of empirical information, but he doesn't know anything. You know, <laughs> I mean, he has all these facts and data and you know, chromatography and screens and you know, and photographs, but he doesn't know anything because that's not the same thing as knowing. That's not really a question, but I bet you can respond to it. It's absolutely perfectly put. What we see in the present and then what we see in the past, it ties in with all these notions of uh, what is memory and what is imagination. I mean, it strikes me sometimes that our memory is sort of three-quarters imagination and then the rest of it is sort of made up with lies or perceptions about how we want to be ourselves. So these cameras that catch our present tense then inform our future in a way and it's um there's nobody better actually than don delillo at talking about these notions of surveillance who we are what we want to want to become and it ties in also with the notion eduardo galliano says that the time that was continues to tick inside the time that is and I love I loved that notion. And so uh, with 13 Ways of Looking, I really wanted to talk about time, the movement of time, backwards and forwards, how the present is supremely influenced by the past, but also the prospect of the future. Our actions are sort of constantly unfolding and how we remember things that happen to us. And that comes up, once again, I, I'm, I'm using these two stories that kind of frame the book in contrast with one another, but it comes up in that final story, Treaty, where Beverly, this uh, nun who's been raped and brutalized uh, by this uh, this South American man uh, during a time of insurgency when she's a Mary Knoll nun in the country, she she sees this man 37 years later on television, and she's absolutely certain that she's seen this man, that there he is, uh, certain enough to go to London for the purposes of confronting him. But then some of that certainty starts to erode. It comes, that question comes up again. How do we know? You know, how do we know? Things change. He could have a twin. He could have somebody who looks a lot like him. A lot of time has passed. And so she has, I mean, her only real way of knowing in a way is to confront him. And he eventually confirms it all in one word, right? Exactly. Yeah, well, you, you read it so carefully because um, that's what I was going for. With that particular story, um, I wanted to talk about uh, the idea of forgiveness. How do we forgive? Do we forgive absolutely uh, when somebody has done something awful to us? How certain are we about what's going to happen in the world? Which really ties into the, the whole incident that you mentioned at the start of the program, what happened uh, in Connecticut last summer uh, or 15 months ago. Funnily enough, I was sort of three quarters of the way through the novella, and the novella being about the character who gets that that random punch. Also, I was about halfway through the short story Treaty when I had an incident in New Haven. I got punched. I was in and out of hospital with various ailments for a couple of months afterwards. So the punch, in a strange way, it's like fiction preceding reality then reality, then putting a map on how I was going to try and negotiate that whole incident. Uh, maybe you will will or will not forgive me for this because in a way it seems kind of glib. But when I first heard about this and first read about it, I mean, first of all, obviously, like everybody else, I was very shocked and distressed. This wasn't a casual injury to you. Uh, you were right. knocked unconscious. I think you woke up being loaded into an MRI machine and yeah, multiple surgeries and hospital visits and things like that to correct this, to say nothing of the psychological damage. My first reaction was, 
even well before this collection, but having read Let the Great World Spin, I thought it just seems like a Colin McCann thing happened to Colin McCann. So much of what you write about is everything that's latent and potentially dangerous and surprising in everyday reality. It seemed like a scene that could have been cut from Let the Great World Spin, that that fiction was kind of rising up to seize you. I, I doubt that you would have had that kind of distance to think about it at that time. But as a writer, how does it seem now? Certainly not at that time, because I'll tell you the truth. I have to say I learned so much. And some people were so good to me. I have to say that the people um, in Connecticut, in the law system, in the, in the legal system, and people wrote me letters afterwards saying, I'm sorry that this happened to you in Connecticut. Uh, there was a huge sort of outpouring of, of kindness and decency. It was very important for, for me to say this. And this was a random sort of incident where I was trying to help a woman on the street who was being beaten herself. And it took my breath away and it took my life away for a little while. I was unable to write for a couple of months afterwards. And then I was given a chance in the Connecticut system to write a victim impact statement. So here I was, completely unable to write, and then I had to sit down and say to the court what I thought should happen to the perpetrator, what should happen to him, and what had happened to me. And finally, I crafted this thing for, honestly, Colin, I I crafted it for weeks and weeks. It seemed sort of um, casual and, and easy, but it was a very, very tough thing to do. When finally I was able, able to tell my story, I was able to write again. I was sort of released. I had regained my territory. In the uh, statement, I called on, on the court to say that I, I forgave the person, but I did not excuse him. And this was possibly the most important phrase that I, that I came up with, because I think we can forgive people, but we cannot excuse them for the things that they do. They can't get away with that sort of thing because it's not right. And I got letters from, particularly from women, all over the country and some from various parts of the world saying, thank you for for standing up. But there was also a part of me that felt, I'm an idiot. I felt guilty. I felt, why did I stand up? Why didn't I just walk on and then I, you know, I would have been okay. I wouldn't, you know, I could have let it behind. Why, Why am I sort of involved in in other people's lives? Why don't I just let the misery roll on down the street? So there was a lot of contradictions that I had to deal with. And, but eventually it was the ability to tell my story, the ability to write it down and have it be read to the courts that gave me a release. And, and, and then I sort of took my life back. In a certain way, I threw a little punch back too because uh, the judge laughed and said, well, you, 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 <laughs> you picked the wrong person who was going to go do a victim impact statement because <laughs> you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have picked a writer to do it because I said what I, what, what I, what I really wanted to say. In reading, I reread your um, impact statement uh, before this conversation and, and reading that in conjunction, particularly with the story Treaty, which is about someone who's been very, very badly wronged uh, right. and harmed in a very permanent way, uh, trying to negotiate that same set of questions. And I was think I, I mentioned this yesterday. I said, you know, really, what are the English words that are said more than any other English words every single week in the world? And it is the Lord's Prayer, right? I mean, there's probably nothing right. that was more millions and millions and millions of people every week, they say the Lord's Prayer. I mean, they probably say it in a very road away in a lot of cases and don't think about it. But there's that notion of trespass. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I've been giving a very close reading to to Mark lately, just thinking about this. You know, so here's your your character, Sister Beverly, who's a Christian and a nun. It really is true, I think, no matter what you think of Christianity or the divinity of Christ or or any of that, when you're When you confront the message, the message, I think, is do the hard thing. You really have to do the hard thing. You know, the easy thing isn't that interesting. If you even look at what Jesus says, he's not really, I mean, you know, early on, they say, why are you eating with tax collectors? Everybody hates tax collectors. And tax collectors at that time, they were like the worst people in the world. They were really kind of ripping off their own population and sending some of the money to Rome and keeping the rest of it. And he said, because that's who I have to eat with, (laughs) because everybody hates these people. They're horrible people. What, what, I'm going to go eat with nice people? What would be the point? And to me, that's, that's there in the story. It's there in your impact statement, too. Like, what's the yeah. hard thing? How do I do the hard thing? Quite frankly, there were a lot of people who felt that this attacker should go to prison, including the judge herself who said that she was making the, the, the sentence more lenient because I called for him not to go to prison. Um, 
So I, I don't think there's any point in him going, spending a long, long time in prison. In the end, there was a three-week sentence imposed. But I just think there's so much bad stuff in the, in the prison system. Many years ago, I worked with juvenile delinquents in Texas, and one of the kids who came out of the, the program ended up um, going to prison after making a threatening remark on President Clinton. This is many, many years ago. And, and the experiences that he had in prison were so horrific that it sort of put me off the idea almost entirely. But the gentleman who was in, in, involved in, in, in the attack, if I can call him that, the gentleman, he has probation. And so if he does it again to his wife or to anybody else on the street, he will certainly then pay the price. But I suppose what I need to say is that you have to have a certain amount of courage of, of your own convictions um, in order to be able to sort of forgive. And part of me still feels, well, certainly I, I feel torn up about the incident, but I feel that in the process of being allowed to tell my story and to hear the story of other people, because let's face it, I got thumped around a little bit. Some people get thumped around a little bit every single day. Other people are coming home from, from wars. Other people are, have things much, much, much more difficult to happen to them. My problem was, or my difficulty, my choice was, do I say anything about this? Do I keep my mouth shut and go on and heal in my own little quiet way? Or do I actually put out my victim impact statement and begin to talk about it so that others might be able to talk about it? And I don't want to proselytize, but I do think that we need to give people a chance to tell one another's stories. That's why um, I was actually in Connecticut with my um, non-profit group, Narrative 4, which is a, a story exchange organization. And funnily enough, I was given the keynote speech on, on empathy, or do so the following night. But our, our organization believes very powerfully that the exchange of stories, that you step into my shoes and I step into yours, can alter the world in very significant ways. I think the other part of this, and it's so clear in the story treaty, in your story treaty, Colin McCann, and I assume it's clear to you too, although maybe sometimes it's easier to see something about a character you're writing than to see it about yourself, is that you know we do ultimately build our own hells and stay in them, live in them, because we don't forgive, because we don't change. So Sister Beverly is not in a good place. I mean, she's had these secondary medical problems that are a result of stress because she's tried to kind of throw herself into other kinds of mission work here in the U.S. without ever really dealing with this terrible trauma. And she's in every way a person who's suffocating, you know, she's and being suffocated by this story and has no particular way of opening up a valve that will let any oxygen into her. Presumably, I mean, we don't really know because of where the story ends, but we presume, yes, you know, maybe some valve does get opened in this process. I would assume that's true for you, too, in order to really go forward and not be in a hell that was initially built by this attacker, but then maybe maintained by you because of all the negativity and fear and, and resentment that would be just conjured up inside a person who's so badly treated by another human being that you, you've somehow or other you've got to break that cage. After a while, you have to acknowledge you've been maintaining the cage. That's perfectly put because I did put up a cage around myself. I was like, oh, well, this is my fault. I asked for this. Maybe I deserved this. Maybe I had this coming to me. I was unable to find that release valve. I have found a release valve now. I know I have. I'm fully, I'm fully recovered physically. And I feel like I'm much stronger mentally from the victim impact statement right through the core of the stories and what the stories try to say. Because I do believe in grace and I do believe in in redemption. I know it's not fashionable. I know it's not fashionable to be sort of optimistic. Um, <laughs> and it's much easier to be cynical. But I find that there's a real muscularity and toughness in a proper sense of optimism that says, yes, the world is dark. Yes, the world is dreary. Yes, it can put us in terrible, terrible cages. But in the end, there is a way to get out. And I, I feel that I've been almost graced in a way by this incident which which sort of makes my mind bigger makes my makes my heart bigger i do not want to turn justice into revenge we can see what happens all around the world when people try to avenge and revenge one another i think um 
one of the things that we have to do is, is to be big enough to take it and move on, but not to excuse it, because that, that sort of behavior is never right. And we, we can change things at the core, at the fundamental thing, we can change things by being, being able to talk about them and bringing these things out in public. If you think about like all the campus talk about um, sexual violence on campus, I'm convinced that the, the rates of violence will go down because now we're finally prepared to stand up there and say, this is wrong. And I think that there's a grace and there's a redemption in that. We're talking to Colin McCann. The new book is 13 Ways of Looking. So these stories were essentially completed, maybe revisable, maybe like a blackboard bird. You could look at them in a, in a different way after the incident in New Haven. But I also wondered about what it was like going forward to fresh material after this. And, and let me explain specifically what I want to know about, which is when you're the creator, the difference between the creator and the audience is if I'm the audience, if I'm the reader, if I'm the watcher, you know, and I see sympathetic characters. I hope bad things don't happen to them. You know, I mean, I don't want any, if I see somebody nice up there on the movie, movie screen, I read about a nice person there on a page. I, I really don't want a bad thing to happen to them. But as the creator, if you're not able to have bad things happen, then you're going to write you know, short stories where people sit with their hands folded in their lap for pages <laughs> on end, and that's not going to be that interesting. So you have to be able to disrupt the world of other people. And having had your own world so violently disrupted, I'm wondering whether it was hard to get back to that frame of mind where I'm going to create people and then things are going to happen to them. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe because of any self-protective feelings you had towards yourself after that, it was hard to make things happen to characters. There was that initial paralysis where I was, there was absolutely nothing happening for me and I thought I was not going to be able to lift myself out of it. But in the end, you know, I've been writing now for 25 years, since my mid-twenties. I'm making, a, thankfully, amazingly to me, make it, making a, a living as a writer. So part of it is ingrained that I know the process and I know that there is no such thing as light unless you get into the darkness. But the equivalent also uh, occurs at the same time. There's no darkness unless you get into the light. And I like this tension. I like the fact that I wake up in the morning. In my relatively tame life in, in New York, I have three kids. I have a dog. I go uh, running around the, the reservoir. For my sins, I even live on the, on the Upper East Side of New York. But then part of my day is always spent in that tension, the creative tension that says that you have to look without rose-colored glasses, uh, how tough and truly dark the world can be. Many years ago, I uh, wrote a book called This Side of Brightness, where I got to know and, and stay with the homeless people in the subway tunnels of New York, on and off for about a year and a half. And I will tell you this, these people lived in awful, awful situations. There was like Vietnam vets, former ABC News uh, reporters, there were people who, who were crack addicts and the prostitution, all sorts of people were down in the tunnels. The misery of all human misery was available and on display, but to a single person, every single one of them, eventually, when I got to know them, would say to me, when I get out of here, mm -hmm. not if I get out of here, but when I get out of here. And it was always, no matter how dark it happened to be, they would always say to me, or at least suggest to me, that there was a glimmer, there was a possibility that things were, were going to change for them. And I like that idea. Uh, we're talking to Colin McCann. We promised him this would be about 30 minutes, so we're running out. I wanted to talk to you about the Middle East, but maybe we'll have to do that um, uh, on another time. I know you've gotten very interested in that and interested in writing about it. Well, let me just ask you one question about that anyway. So that there's a situation where it's hard not to write as an outsider, right? No matter how long you spend there, how long you look at it, you're still yeah. an outsider. So why is that interesting to you? I mean, you could more easily probably write about things where, that you can live inside. Absolutely. And, you know, one thing that's interesting to me is that people tell you that you should write about what you know about. And they're absolutely right. You should write what you know about. But I like to flip it in, in a way and say, write towards what you want to know. And sometimes even write what you don't know. Because in the process of writing what you don't know, you will discover things that you knew but you weren't entirely conscious of or aware of. So in relation to the Middle East, I have no idea 
why it is that I want to go there. I'm going there in a couple of weeks and write about the area, except I feel it in my bones. I did write a novel called Transatlantic, where I spent a lot of the novel with Senator George Mitchell, who helped us in Ireland achieve peace in, in Northern Ireland, which is held more or less now for 17 years. He went to the Middle East after going to Northern Ireland, and he was unable to really budge anyone whatsoever. And I'm fascinated by this, and I want to know what that looks like. And I will go in as an outsider. In terms of the creative process, I can't go in as an outsider and pretend I know everything about the West Bank, Israel. And and what I will have to do is make one of my main characters into an outsider. That character, in some ways, will be a reflection of me. And so I'll bring that character probably from a Northern Irish context into the Middle East to look around and with fresh sort of, hopefully with fresh new eyes. And she will help me uh, negotiate that territory. However, I might talk to you a year from now and say, you know what, I had to throw that idea away because it was just too hard. And I know that's one of the most complicated areas of of the world. It's, It's not just two sides. But there seems to me to be a sort of infinite number of sides. Well, Colin McCann, first of all, I hope you will talk to me uh, in a year. And uh, let's end on one potentially happy note, too, which is uh, I know there was going to be a J.J. Abrams version of Let the Great World Spin. And then he got all distracted by, I'm not familiar with this, but Star Words, Star Things or something like that. I think a little spaceship uh, film of some some sort. Don't know anything about it, really. But so is there, will we someday get that film? Do Do you have hope? We're hoping. We're hoping. Um, I mean, he, we were going to do it, and we were very, very close. And then, yes, he got distracted and taken away by the aliens for, for a little while. He's a genius. He can do whatever he wants to do. He's also a very, very, very creative and loyal person. So I believe that uh, you know he wants to do the story, Let the Great World Spin. Hopefully, one of these days, you'll see it at your, your local cineplex. That would be a nice thing. But... Um, I'm going to go forward and explore new territory while we wait for that to happen. Well, listen, I look forward to our conversation a year from now. Colin McCann, the new book, 13 Ways of Looking. So here from the city of the Blackbird, thank you very much and farewell. Thank you so much. That was a pre-recorded interview with Colin McCann. Next, you'll hear from another big-time author. This one, David Mitchell, when we get back. Let the great world spin. Snow glow with your dreams and hopes. The last time uh, we talked to David Mitchell, he was busy saving my bacon. Uh, it's too, too complicated. It would take forever to explain. But it got us very excited about his new book, Slade House. Of course, David Mitchell is the author of Cloud Atlas and the Bone Clocks. He's written a very different kind of book in Slade House. And from the moment we meet his first protagonist, it seems like Nathan would be like a really good you know, protagonist of a book. He's a young boy. He seems to have some special gifts. He's uh, obviously somewhere on the Asperger spectrum. He's got synesthesia. Uh, He seems like a very engaging, interesting guy with this kind of overbearing mother. It turns out he's just cannon fodder or whatever the supernatural equivalent of that is. There are many more victims to come and the plot is going to thicken a lot. And we're going to make sure we don't spoil any of it for you because you're going to want to read it. But David Mitchell, this is a little bit of a jump off for you, right? This is a, a, a more condensed, densely packed kind of fun thriller. What impelled you to write it? It's just really what the book itself wanted to be, Colin. I've always been attracted to ghost stories and tales of the supernatural. These human beings are and human cultures always have been. And when I had the idea for Slade House, it didn't want to be the kind of book I normally write. Mm -hmm. It wanted to be a ghost story. So out of fidelity to it, I allowed it to take the form that it wanted to take, which is, as you say, this, uh, this... rather dark story, probably with a higher body count than I normally have. Uh, perhaps I was slightly uh, operating under the spell of George R. R. Martin as well, because I'd been watching the HBO Game, Game of Thrones. Thrones. Yeah, and I also saw a very amusing T-shirt which said "Guns Don't Kill, George R. R. Martin Kills." And this sort of just got me to thinking about the um, costs and the uh, payoffs of not shrouding all of your characters in a cloak of invulnerability, whereby However much danger you apparently put them in, the reader always kind of knows that they'll be all right in the end. If they're not all right in the end, then you know, uh, you, um, you lose a good character. On the other hand, you 
sharpen and strengthen and, and, and fire 20,000 volts through the danger that uh, you generate later on in the book. These things are in the back of my mind as well. Another book that it reminds me of, another book and movie that it reminds me of a little bit in its structure and tone, well, and even in certain aspects of its outcome, although we're not giving anything away here, is The Exorcist, is William Peter Blatty's The Exorcist. Yeah, and yeah, my and word. And I'll tell you what I mean by that, too. Both Slade House and The Exorcist are books in which the reader understands far better and for a long time what the protagonists slash victims are dealing with. So, you know, as you're watching the movie The Exorcist or you're reading the book, you see this mother trying to help her daughter in all the ways that aren't going to work. You know something. You know something very dire that the characters don't know. And there's so a high level of frustration with that as you watch one sheep after another watch into the abattoir. <laughs> Thank you very much, Colin. I'll use that line in future interviews. But <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Yes, age, age, old trick of dramatic irony, that, isn't it? You know more than the characters. And this makes a part of you sort of half turn away and half hide your eyes and, and while you scream, no, no, <laughs> don't do it. If you get it right, it works. If you get it wrong, it's, um, it is, as you say, simply frustrating. But if you get it right, the sense of pathos can be almost unendurably beautiful. Uh, so I have this theory of horror that, uh, and this isn't, I wouldn't exactly call this horror, but this, this is the kind of book that you have sort of two choices. You can read half of it and go to bed and have bad dreams, or you can read all of it and go to bed and have bad dreams. Uh, <laughs> but you're not going to get out of the bad dreams part. But it reminds me of a, a theory of horror that I kind of stole from Stephen King, and that yeah. is that horror works especially well, or at least fear-based fiction works especially well, when it kicks some kind of tripwire of the moment, when it's about something that people are kind of worried about anyway. And I mean, one example he gave was that, you know, the book and movie, The Amityville Horror, kind of came when the economy was a little bit shaky and people were treating their houses as investments <laughs> instead of as like, places to live. Yeah. And so you have this this horror in which the main fear is that they might lose the house, which is not all that scary when you really think about it. Here, once again, I'm, I'm making an effort not to give away anything, but it seems to me there's two things that, that kind of make this of the moment. And you can tell me whether you think this is maybe too deep a dive into what's essentially a, a fun piece of writing. But one of them is we have this huge cohort of baby boomers who are afraid of aging. And there are some characters in this book who are especially afraid of aging. And yeah. rather than getting Botox, they have something better than Botox, right? <laughs> they, they don't have to have work done. They have, a, they have a different way of solving this. And we also have a cohort of baby boomers who are entering their early senescence. They're entering their, their what's now called early old age. And they don't necessarily have their parachutes all that well packed spiritually, right? They don't really know exactly what they believe uh, yeah. about the soul and stuff. So to me, those two things, I don't know if they were uppermost in your mind, but they seem like they're both there in the book. Well, that's beautiful and perceptive analysis of my book, Colin. Mm. Thanks once again. Uh, I'll be using this in the future. <laughs> um, uh, yes, these were in my mind because I feel them myself. You don't have to be a baby boomer in his or her 60s to be feeling this. A Generation Y person like myself. Am I X or Y? I always forget. But uh, you can be in your 40s <laughs> and still begin to feel the cold breath of these issues that you um, eloquently put your finger on. You can feel the cold breath of these breathing down your neck as well, especially like your line about your spiritual parachutes being not that well prepared or padded. I do feel that uh, we need a healthier relationship with mortality than fear, a culture which often evolves to sort these things out for us, to sort societal problems out. It's really pretty useless on this. It hasn't got much to say apart from denial, be quiet, here's another beauty magazine about homes that are nicer than yours. It's a sort of ostrich reflex, I think, to not look at it. But um, I don't think this is very good for us. It's good for us in this hour because we don't have to think about sobering thoughts. But it's not good for us in a sort of year by year, decade by decade level as we age. And we need a relationship with mortality whereby death is not a scary grim reaper at the end, but a companion who walks with you through life and just murmurs in your ear, just reminding you not to waste time and not to waste this 
beautiful day, this beautiful November day, and not to go to bed with an argument that you haven't patched up with someone you care about, because you can't get the stave back, and there's not many of them. There's not as many as you think. So this is the sort of a spirit that sort of haunts the corridors of my book, this wish to think about mortality now while we can still do so usefully, rather than wait until we're in uh, the hospital ward or the hospice, which we are in all too much danger of doing. Right. No, I mean, we're, what does John Irving say, we're all terminal cases. Another thing that I noticed in this book, and it's not a p- overplayed, it's, but it's sort of there, is the notion of a resistance movement, right? There's a way in which in this book, once again, I'm, I'm endeavoring to give nothing away, but you see one victim after another passing tiny smidgens of information to the next round of potential victims, kind of, and I'm sure in any kind of incredibly oppressive situation, whether it was uh, the concentration camps, you know, or or some other kind of totalitarian system, there is that. It's kind of, I'm not going to make it, but here's one tiny useful thing that I can give to you. Maybe you can make it. And there is that kind of chain of information in your book. Yeah, yeah, there is. I'm really glad you noticed that. This is the host at Slade House are not who they appear to be. The victims of Slade House, they also have this uh, kernel of the nut inside them, inside of which they are also not victims. They're not passively going to take this. I haven't had this thought, but just as you mentioned that, while I was writing Slade House, I read a book that made an enormous impact on me, a book um, I think by an American journalist, Barbara Elrich, called Nothing to Envy, about North Korea. And I apologise to her if she's listened to this and I've gotten her surname wrong, but uh, she did a series of interviews with uh, people who who had escaped North Korea and had written down their stories, and the resilience and the ingenuity uh, with which they had passed things on and had things passed to them, uh, information, objects, maps, anything, in order to survive. It was really very moving, and these words are banded about, but they're quite appropriate here, Uh, a great testament to the human spirit. One of the other things that happens in a book like this is, um, and here, once again, we have a little bit of a a parallel with The Exorcist, is the reader is longing for someone to show up with the requisite amount of expertise to deal with this situation. But I always thought that The Exorcist had an interesting structure in the sense that it, interestingly, I I think also kicks against the tripwires of its moment. It was a a book and and a movie launched, I think, in the 1970s with the kind of rise of therapeutic culture and the notion that you you could sort of figure out people's problems one way or another. And so you have this mother who's taking her daughter to experts, but they're the wrong kinds of experts. You know, they're going psychiatrists and hypnotists and spinal tap neurologists. And the the whole audience in the movie theater is going, what are you, crazy? She doesn't need that. She needs an exorcist. You should be getting a (laughs) priest, you know, which is not necessarily what we would say to our friends. But there is this kind of sense in this book, too, that that the, the wrong kind of people are going in there, people who are necessary to the ghouls who rule this book, but they're they're not the right kind of expert. But eventually a certain kind of expert does kind of enter the picture. And it does make me wonder, and I think I can ask you this question without doing a spoiler, that it seemed as though there might be room for this particular character to go forward. This would be an African-American character born, I think, in Baltimore in 1980. This character seemed as though there might be a possible, possibility of future David Mitchell uh, books featuring this person. Has that crossed your mind? Oh, absolutely, yes, Colin. That's impressive analysis of the Exodus by the way, and I, remem- and I remember that scene very, very clearly. And it's not a horror scene, it's not a special effects scene, but it's still one of the most memorable scenes of the whole film, mm-hmm. where she asks, where she, she, she's just reduced to a quivering wreck in a room of experts. She just sort of says, can anybody tell me what's the <laughs> matter with my child? Right. And they're beaten, they look at each other and someone mumbles something about, it's this psycho babbly, well, maybe it's a... Uh, uh, an extreme case of metamorphic gobbledy gobbledy blah, 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 blah. I can't remember what the words are, but it's it's just rubbish. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, they need an exorcist. Regarding regarding Slade House and the character to whom you refer, yeah, who is not new not new to you anyway, but it just seemed like no. this thing seems like a very interesting new set of adventures for this character. Yeah, I'm planning a sort of a long term maybe 20, 30 years after the Bone Clock, sort of a part three of the trilogy that that character appears in. And as you know, the person we're talking about has has quite a negotiable relationship with mortality himself or herself. 
one of the reasons I wrote to Slade House is, is it sort of if this character is my Sherlock or my Batman or my main creation, then it's about time that the character had an arch enemy, had a nemesis. Because <laughs> really, what is Sherlock without Moriarty? What is right. Batman without the Joker? He or she needed uh, someone who would hate them implacably forever <laughs> and uh, form this sort of odd hate-love relationship in future appearances. So Slade House, again, I hope I haven't given too much away there, but I wrote Slade House to fit that bill. Mm. As well as doing other things, I love your remarks and Stephen King's perceptive comment that horror taps into anxieties in the zeitgeist. Uh, that's really true, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it is true. I mean, I think it's the paradox, right, that we think that horror is uh, implicitly about the supernatural. So the supernatural is eternal. So the supernatural is unchanging. It shouldn't be affected by temporal circumstances. And our reactions to it should be very persistent over time. But it's, I think it's not. I think it, it has to get at certain things, you know, and, and certain just to go back to The Exorcist, not too long before The Exorcist, the Exorcist there was a, a book. It was kind of a horrible book in some ways. It was written by Philip Reef, I think, called The Triumph of the Therapeutic. And he was kind of making an argument that therapeutic culture was going to take over and was going to drive out everything else. Everything else implicitly, I think, was sort of religion and any kind of supernatural understanding of the world. And The Exorcist really was this sort of big donkey kick back at that, sort of saying, <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> Just a bit of brief thumbnail description of that book. It sounds as quaint and idealistic as a utopia society building project in North America in the 19th century where, where, where some brand new religion would trek across the continent and, and, and establish heaven on earth. Right. I mean, it, it's of a much more recent era, <laughs> but you can still hear reality chuckling in your ear thinking, oh yeah, you reckon you've solved it, do you? Well, you've got another thing coming. And in Slade House, there's a little of that struggle too, in the sense that Slade House advances in nine-year increments. So in each iteration, people have begun to process the world a little bit differently. In other words, the things that the, the first protagonists deal with are different by nine years of societal and technological evolution uh, so that, you know, I mean, eventually people are using cell phones, but at the beginning of the book, I mean, this is once again, very, it's very David Mitchell in a lot of ways, but it is interesting to see horror proceed that way where each kind of quote unquote generation of victims or, or people entering this, this matrix are a little bit different. They're not vastly different. It's not a complete generational evolution, but it's nine years worth of change. Yeah, and if you look at Nathan at the beginning of the book and the inverted commas guest who goes by his um, internet handle Bombadil at mm -hmm. the yes. end of the book, there is sort of quite a different stream than there's 45 years worth of societal change. I mean, that's almost a different historical era. Uh, not quite. But yeah, um, it, it, it was important to get that right. The world makes us in subtle and slightly different ways. As you notice when you've lived that long yourself, 46, and I can sort of look back at my teenage self and things I wrote when I was a teenager, even the language I used in letters when I was uh, a teenager, without ever having noticed uh, at a day-by-day -day level. It's morphed, it's changed, it's different, and the world has been rewritten yet again in a slightly different form by the ever-evolving now. We're talking to David Mitchell. His book is Slade House. You also know him from Cloud Atlas and the Bone Clocks. We'll have more of that conversation after this. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me, Kion Wolf. Greg Hill tweets for us at WNPR Colin, and the part of Bill Curry was played by Margaret Atwood. For show pages, articles, and photos of the staff of Here and Now, buried up to their necks in ramen noodles, visit our website, wnpr.org slash Colin. On tomorrow's show, a special high-dork Star Wars edition of The Nose. And now, back to Colin. David Mitchell is the author of Cloud Atlas and the Bone Clocks. He's written a very different kind of book in Slade House. Were there specific, I mean, you'd mentioned George R. R. Martin. Did you grow up reading this kind of book? Did you grow up liking to be scared or unsettled? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of us do. My idea of uh, a really enjoyable Saturday afternoon was to go to the bookshop and read the backs of all the genre fiction books there. 
So I love to read the cover blurbs for James Herbert books and Stephen King's books. I mean, he is the he's the grand master of this. The commercial sector has long realised what a valuable commodity he is. Then there's the um, the European slash English tradition of the ghost story. There's writers like M. R. James, W. W. Jacobs. They were at it in the first half of the uh, 20th century. And again, it, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, once you start to look beyond the genre and look at what was going on in history at, at the time, there was a boom in ghost story writing in the 1920s uh, when most of the UK uh, had had family member or a friend or someone very close to them not come back from the trenches in Flanders. It was all in the air, in the ether. So, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've always enjoyed those stories as well, uh, even when I was a kid and wasn't necessarily thinking of the historical context. Right. It's, you know, they say there's no atheists in the foxholes, but as is sort of in the backstory of Slade House, there is that kind of suggestion, too, that there are, there are no non-seance participants in, in a world where many people die, in a world where people die of influenza or World War I, and, and people are constantly seeking uh, other people. You may have been uh, a hard-rooted uh, cynic or pragmatist uh, until the day that you really need to talk to somebody who's not alive anymore. And I think that comes out really well in this book. I have to quickly tell you a story, because uh, and you'll, you'll like this, I think. Yeah. So I took this book with me to Montreal, and I was staying in Montreal, not in Montreal. <laughs> I was staying in the worst possible place to read this book. Uh, so I was staying south of the St. Lawrence River in a sh- a town called Chateau Gay, and because, right. uh, we were renting a little cottage for about four days, and it sat. I had a marsh, a completely desolate, deserted <laughs> November marsh, right off the the back deck, and and then the St. Lawrence River is kind of on the other side of it, and yeah. it was it was relatively remote. It was a place I was completely unfamiliar with, which is always which will always ratch up your anxieties. I yeah. didn't know the creaks and groans that the house ordinarily admitted. I'd never yeah. been there before, and then yeah. to make matters worse, it was a peculiarly decorated house. It was decorated by, oh, I should mention also there was a large kind of bleak Mohawk uh, Indian reservation right next door to it. But anyway, right. and then a graveyard full of um, nuns right down the road too, the gray nuns of Montreal. I mean, really, you just couldn't. Wow. You, but then here's the here's the great thing. All right. So the house was kind of peculiarly decorated and it had a lot of places where <laughs> <laughs> where instead, of, where, where a wall really should have been, there was just a floor-to-ceiling mirror. Well, mirror. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So mirrors, first of all, are not completely unimportant in in Slade House. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, it also it, that the the effect there, therefore, is if you're like sitting in some recliner chair re- reading Slade House and you move your elbow. You see movement off to the side where you don't really think there should be movement, and it's actually yeah. just this stupid mirror. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was so jumpy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, uh, that's a delicious scenario you're describing. But wouldn't it be spookier if you saw the um, movement off to the side about one second after you'd moved your elbow? Right. Well, yeah. I mean, I think I was probably processing it that way anyway. But you should, you know, you should make all the critics read Slade House in that little cabin. Uh, the spooky uh, I'm in there, and the, it really—I mean, I really was sort of like looking under the sofa and stuff to make sure no one was waiting to steal my soul. Uh, if I was that influential, then I would send uh, all the critics to uh, that particular haunted house. And um, I think you might have hit upon a new sort of idea for tourism there, for a sort of niche boutique. We'll give you the book and and the right place to read it, or the right slash in inverted commas wrong place to read it. I mean, that sounds absolutely perfect. Yeah, that, I'm sure if Disney goes into publishing, that's what you'll, they'll do. You, the book will be a ride. You'll read the book while you're sitting in some... Yeah, yeah. I was uh, looked on the YouTube the other day and found in North America you actually have Halloween houses, which are these sort of superbly state-of-the-art houses which give visitors the experiences that they have in the worst possible slasher movie, yes. uh, in the most frightening X-rated 18-plus film, obviously without the literal murder, but everything but that, uh, that they exist to scare the bejesus out of you. Perhaps there's sort of a milder 
literary version could be done for books like Slade House. Yeah, I think Neil Gabler wrote a book called "Amusing Ourselves to Death." This could actually it, it could actually work the, literally that way. Um, <laughs> David Mitchell, uh, the book is Slade House. Uh, the other books, uh, of course, uh, are Cloud Atlas and The Bone Clocks. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. Uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Uh, I've learned a lot from conversation, Colin. Thanks for <laughs> having me on your program. All right, I hope we'll speak again. Yeah, me too. Okay, bye bye. Thanks for listening. Come back tomorrow for our uber Star Wars news with hardcore Star Wars geeks like you've never heard it before. 